Okay, so hi everybody. Um, so it's lecture 23. Um, uh, oh, sorry, just a second. Yeah, so it's, um, oh, I don't know how this keeps happening. Okay, let's change the size back to, so it's uh, lecture 23. And in this lecture, there are two parts. So one is I'm going to finish probability. I'm going to tell you about two very important and useful inequalities, uh, both in pure and applied math, uh, which are Markov's inequality and Chebyshev's inequality. Um, and then we're gonna move to a new topic, which is the last new topic of the course, and that is graph theory. So begin graph theory. So that's chapter nine. And this is, it's you're, we're really switching gears a little bit here. There's a lot more emphasis on uh, writing again, writing proofs, even more than the beginning of the course. And the other thing I want to uh, say is that we're going to skip ch chapter eight, which is relations. And the reason is that, well, we don't really cover this in any depth anyway in this course, and it's it's actually pretty straightforward, and you can just learn it by yourself if you need to use it later. If you do want to read about it, the the part that's most useful is a part about equivalence relations. Uh, but you know, if you need to use that in other courses, it will be taught to you again, so don't worry about it. But what I'd rather do is spend more time on this and really do this in some depth so that we learn some some interesting math. So that's the plan. So we start by uh, talking about uh, probability. So we actually left on kind of an unfinished note. So recall at the end of the last lecture, we were considering, so I'll just show you the slide, we were considering the following problem. So you're given a coin with some unknown bias Q. That's a number that could be between zero and one. You don't know what it is. And the question is, how do you estimate this number Q? So we had this idea, sorry, I don't know what this is doing. Uh, we had this idea that, well, many people naturally came up with, which is just flip the coin a bunch of times, some N times independently, then count the number of heads that you see. And uh, that's a random variable. So we call that X, X is the number of heads. And then uh, somehow the fraction of times that you saw heads, we intuitively believe that should be a good approximation to the bias of the coin. So the idea was kind of outlined in this top half of this page. So let me copy that over to the new lecture. Whoa. Uh, okay, not sure what's going on here. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess this has to do with the uh, font size somehow being changed. But yeah, okay, now so th there was this cool application from the last lecture. And we did a, we did a calculation with this random variable in the last lecture which I won't repeat, I'll just show you. We calculated its variance. So this, this X over N, which is the fraction of heads that were seen, which we also called Q hat, we calculated its variance using linearity of expectation. So using, we decomposed it as a sum of random variables that just look at one coin flip at a time. And then using the independence of these coin flips, we, we use this, you know, 
this theorem to say the variance is the sum of the variances and we calculated it. And we got this number Q times one minus Q uh, over N. So let me just recall that. So, so last time we calculated um, that the variance of this number Q hat is Q times one minus Q over N. By the way, we don't know what Q is, right? But nonetheless, you know, there is some underlying Q. So this calculation is correct. We don't know what Q is, but regardless of what Q is, this number is always at most uh, a quarter over N, which is one over four N. And the reason is, well, you know, we did this calculation that Q times one minus Q, which is the variance of a single coin flip is maximized when Q is a half in the last lecture, right? So this is maximized for Q equals a half. So this is where we were at the end of the last lecture, but this doesn't really answer the question of why is Q hat likely to be close to Q, right? So remember Q hat is random. So even if the bias was one half, we could have got unlucky and just got all tails and then Q hat would be zero. So it's not true that Q hat is always close to Q. What we, what we care about is the event that Q hat is close to you, Q. So we want to know how likely it is that this number that we, uh, you know, or that we calculated Q hat is close to the true bias. So the, the question we're really interested in is, uh, what is the probability that Q is close to Q hat? So, okay, we haven't defined small. Uh, so, okay, let, let's just do it sort of intuitively right now. How likely is it that Q hat is close to Q? Well, the answer, so again, this is an event. So we need to, uh, you know, now define, a, this is, we need to say what about equals means. So let's settle for, um, so, so let's say Q hat is close to Q if the difference is at most point one, right? So this bias is some number between zero and one. So consider the event E, which is the event uh, that Q minus Q hat is less than 0 0.1, right? So really there's some sample space and in here, in some subset of the outcomes, you have that Q hat minus Q is less than 0 0.1. Okay, that's not a very good picture. Let me redraw that. So we're interested in the probability of this of this event. This is the probability that, you know, we didn't get unlucky and the, the, exp the fraction we observed is close to the true fraction. So remember Q hat is random, right? This is a random variable. This is this X over N. Whereas Q is this fixed hidden number that we don't know. We're trying to learn Q. And so now the question we're interested in is what is the probability of this event? We would like to choose N so that this probability becomes high and then we have a high confidence that this Q hat is close to Q. So any, before we show how to do this, any questions about what I just said? Okay. So the main tool we use to establish this is something is, um, it's called Chebyshev's inequality. But before telling you that, let me tell you something even simpler called Markov's inequality. I mean, I guess this isn't really a new section. Okay, so let's first do an example, which is actually based on real data. So let Y be the, so consider the following experiment. 
the experiment is I choose a random student in this class and look at their midterm two score. So choose a random student and I have a random variable Y, which is their midterm score, their midterm two score. So I, many people have asked, so let me tell you what some of the features of this random variable actually are. So the expected value of the midterm score was actually 80 in midterm two, which is very good. So well done. And now uh, let's ask the following question. Suppose I just give you this information that the average was 80. What's the probability? What's the probability that Y is bigger than 90? So what's the fraction of students who got more than 90? Can you say anything about that? from this information. So, you know, there's a sample space. And in here, there's some, you know, there's some event, which is that the score was bigger than 90. And we have some other information, which is that the expected value is 80. Can I say anything about the probability of this event, that Y is bigger than 90 from this information? I would say no, because you would need to know the variance. Okay, you're saying, no. Okay. Well, you can say something, right? Could everybody have got 90? Could everybody get over 90? No. No, right? Because then the expectation would be more than 90. So you can say something. Could, you know, could 99% of people have got more than 90? Well, you can say it's under 50%. Where did you get the number 50%? Because if it's above half the class must have done above the average and I'm thinking medium, ignore me. You could have, um, you could have, for example, oh, 10%, I think. Because um, the, oh no, sorry. Uh, what I was thinking was um, you can have a bunch of scores that are uh, say zero. And if you have some scores that are zero, then that means that the uh, upper bound is pretty high. Yeah, so these are all excellent thoughts. So what Hazen said is, a very good point, which is if this was the median, then half the people would have got more than the average. But it's not the median, it's the average. And then Ian is saying that, well, if a bunch of people got, you know, it could be that a bunch of people got zero and then the rest of them got 90. And that seems to be, you know, um, the case that's maximizing the probability of getting 90. But let's now actually do a little calculation to get an upper bound on the probability. So the expected value of Y is the sum over all, um, you know, R in the range of Y of R times the probability that the score was equal to R. That's the definition of expectation. Now I'm gonna split this into two parts. I'm gonna single out the, uh, the terms which correspond to scores bigger than 90. So I'm gonna have the sum Scores bigger than 90, sorry, not 0, 90. And now I have uh, R times probability Y equals R plus the scores that are less than 90. Sorry, this would be Y. And now I'm going to do a sneaky thing. I'm going to use that the scores are always non-negative. There's no negative score in the class, right? So this is always non-negative. So actually, this whole quantity is non-negative. So that means this is bigger than if I just set that to be 0. I could not have done that if that was a, if that was negative, but it's not negative, right? So the expectation is the first term plus something non-negative, so it's bigger than the first term. Any question? Um, so this uh, this uh, uh, equation that you wrote is basically the expectation of y, which is also the the mean value. Yeah, this is the definition of expectation. So the mean value is like 
greater or equal to like the sum of r bigger or equal to 90? Um, uh, well, uh, we haven't uh, we haven't reached that conclusion yet. Uh, but yeah, the mean value is bigger than this term. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Now we're going to do a, a slick thing. All of these R's, right? What do I know about them? They're greater than or equal to 90. Yeah, they're bigger than 90. So if I replace them all by 90, I get another inequality. So I get this is bigger than 90. I just pull it out in the front. Times the probability that Y equals R. But now if I add up the probabilities that Y equals R for all R bigger than 90, well, that's just the probability of this event, right? What's the probability of Y is bigger than 90? Well, it's the sum of the probabilities of Y equals R for R bigger than 90. So this is equal to 90 times the probability that Y is bigger than 90. Uh, Professor, I don't think what you, oh, wait, sorry. It just glitched. It just came up. Sorry. Can you see? Yeah, it's fine now, but it was like taking a minute. Okay, so now the conclusion, what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is that the expected value of Y is bigger than 90 times the probability that Y is bigger than 90. This is actually making formal this fact that, you know, it's, it's only bigger than what it would be if you set everybody else to zero. But now if you rearrange this, you get, that you get a bound on the probability that Y is bigger than 90. This is at most the expected value of y divided by 90, which is 80 over 90, which is 8 over 9. So actually, at most, an 8 over 9 fraction of the class could have got over 90. I'm, this is only an inequality. We don't know what the exact probability is. But the beauty of this is we can get information about what it could be, even if we don't know it exactly. So let's let this sink in a little. So this is a very simple argument, but I mean, I use it all the time. I used it in like the last paper that I wrote in my research and, you know, yesterday. So it's, it's actually a very powerful argument. Any questions about this argument? Explain what the statement expectation of Y greater than 90 times the probability of Y greater than 90 means like just logically. Uh, well, it, 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 it's, uh, it's saying that the average is at least what it would be if you zeroed out everybody that was less than 90. And if you zeroed out everybody less than 90, then the average would be at least 90 times the fraction of people that's left, which is the probability of being bigger than 90. Does that make sense? So looking at this diagram, I'm saying, if I just zero out everybody over here, then I can only make the, because importantly, because the random variable is non-negative, this wouldn't work if it was negative. If I throw away that stuff, I only make the expected value go down. And then, you know, then when I restrict to this Y bigger than 90, I can, you know, I can have, I can have this nice bound on it. So this is, a, a part of a general theorem called Markov's inequality, which I'll just state as a theorem. The proof is just what I wrote just now. Uh, yes, you raised your hand, Ben. Yeah, it's, um, it's like a really small thing, but the second line, uh, the second summation in there, shouldn't it be P of Y equals R? Yes, you're right, you're right. Sorry, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Correct. But in any case, uh, that's right. And I'm just going to zero it out because it's not negative. So, so theorem, which is called Markov's inequality, which is if Y is a non-negative random variable, then for every P positive, the probability that Y is bigger than or equal to T is bounded by the expected value, uh, sorry, Y divided by T. 
So you can get upper bounds. So what they're saying in words is a random, a non-negative random variable is unlikely to be much bigger than its mean. So, you know, a, a very classic uh, special case of this is to plug in P equals twice the average. How likely is a non-negative random variable to be bigger than twice its average? Well, it's bounded by the average divided by twice the average, which is a half. So, you know, a random variable is not negative has only a 50% chance of being twice as big as its average. That intuitively makes sense. So this is not, is not a non-intuitive fact. Any comments or questions about this? What does T stand for? T is just a parameter. You can plug in. So there's a quantifier here, right? For every T. So this is just true for every T. This is like, you're trying to measure, this is how big, uh, you know, deviation from the mean you're trying to get a bound on. So if you put in some small number here, you're not going to get any bound, right? For example, if you put P less than the expected value, what bound do you get on the probability? Something greater than one. Nothing. You get a bound that's greater than one, which is nothing, right? Because the probability is always less than one. So remark, you don't you don't get any bound for t that's less than the expectation. The second remark is you really need them to be non-negative. So you need y is non-negative. Otherwise, this is false in general. Okay, good. So now I'm, that's not enough for, to analyze this question, actually. You need a souped up version of this called Chebyshev's inequality, which I will now tell you. So here's the theorem. The theorem says, if X is any random variable, and it has some expectation mu, or let's just say with expectation equal to mu. Well, okay, that sounds like it's a condition. So let's just say add. Um, and T, is any positive number, then the probability that X is far from the mean, so bigger than P, is bounded by the variance of X divided by T squared. So that's the statement. Now it looks kind of similar to Markov, right? Let's examine the differences and similarities. So the similarity is it's a probability of some event that's relating Y to, well, okay, to, to its mean in some way. But while Markov is a one-sided bound, It doesn't tell you anything about y being small, right? This is a two-sided bound. This is telling you the probability that, um, so this is a two-sided bound. I mean, if you were to draw a picture, you know, you, if suppose y has some distribution, well, okay, let's not draw a picture actually. Uh, this is, so, so um, let's, let, 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 let's draw a little cartoon. 
This is saying that now you have uh, some event in this probability space, which is the event that X is close to its expectation. And this is saying that this has a large probability if the variance is small. So it's really articulating that small variance means a random variable is likely to be concentrated. So before proving this, let's do an example. So again, going back to the midterm, another statistic is that the variance of the score was 40. Uh, sorry, it was 400, okay? Now that sounds like a big number, but you know, uh, th that means the standard deviation, which is square root of the variance was 20. Now, what does that, what does Chebyshev's inequality tell us about the distribution of midterm scores based on this information? Well, it tells us that the probability that the probability that a random person had a score that deviated from the mean, which is 80, by more than um, now let's think about what number we could plug in here. If, if we just plug in 20, we're not going to get anything because the right hand side is going to be one. So let's plug in, I don't know, 25. This is bounded by 400 over 25 squared, which is 625, which is, I don't know, what is that? Um, uh, I mean, does it really matter? It, it's some number uh, less than one. Yeah, or do you know? Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to guess eight over 25 because you can factor out 25. Oh, wait, no, okay. oh, wait. 16 over 25. Oh, 16 okay. over 25. Okay, nice. So, so what is this saying? This thing, if I were to plot the histogram of the exam scores, which I don't know, kind of looked like this, then somewhere in here there was a mean, which is 80. Now, Chebyshev's inequality is saying that, uh, so, so Chebyshev's inequality was telling us that. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, so Chebyshev's inequality is saying that the probability, if you look in a window of 25 around here, so 80 minus 25 is 55, 80 plus 25 is 105, then the probability of being in here was 16 over 25. That's more information than Markov's inequality was telling us. Markov's inequality was just saying there can't be too many people over this 90 mark. So they're giving very different types of information. So this is why standard deviation is released with exam scores. It tells you how tightly the scores are concentrated. Like if the variance had been zero, it would mean everybody got eight. Question? Yes. The probability says the probability of some absolute value is greater than 25. Yeah. Should it not be less than 25? If we're, if we're in that entire uh, yellow region. Right, okay, yeah, okay. Good point, good point. Yeah, I take it back. So the probability in the yellow region is um, is one minus this. Okay, so this is one minus 16 over 25, which is uh, nine over 25. So, okay, that's not a very high probability. It's saying, so, so yeah, so this greater than or equal to, yeah, good point. This greater than or equal to means that you're outside this interval. So the total amount of probability outside over here is at most 16 over 25. So the part inside is at least one minus that. Thank you. I got my signs flipped. Any comments before I talk about the proof of this? Is there any way to get I mean, I imagine there is to to get anything stronger than this. Like it's interesting that we can't tell much uh, yeah, within there is. like that range. There is. So 
no, what's the pattern here? Here I looked at the expectation of y. Here I effectively, you know, what did I do? I looked at the expect, I looked at the variance, which is expectation of x minus its expectation squared, right? I could do the same thing with cubed or fourth or whatever. Those things don't have names, but I mean, they do have names. They're called higher moments and people use them. So yeah, indeed, this is just the first two in a long, you know, infinite list of inequalities you could prove. Great question. So let, let's prove this. Well, before I prove it, any questions about this example? Okay, let's prove it. So proof. The proof, it actually follows from Markov. So, so given the random variable X, X, X may not be non-negative, so I can't apply Markov. But now I'm gonna define a new random variable, Y to be X minus the mean squared. Right, so, okay, yeah. so just to clarify, the, the mean is the expectation of X. And the key thing is this is non-negative. What's the expectation of Y? Well, it's the expectation of X minus mu squared. And what is that? Variance of X. That's the variance of X. So now by Markov, the probability that Y is bigger than P is at most the variance of X divided by T. Now I'm gonna do a cheap trick. Y is not negative, P is not negative. So yeah, assume P is bigger than zero, right? Well, Y is bigger than P if and only if Y squared is bigger than T squared, right? And so I could actually have done Yeah, so 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 so, so I, I can write y squared bigger than t squared here. Or, Do we want to define y differently then? Sorry, sorry, I, I take it back. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I want to actually just change the variable t. So t is a positive number. I'm going to apply this to t squared rather than t. I can do that. Right. I just change the name. It's a positive number. But now what is this probability? Well, this is the probability. So Y is absolute value of X minus mu squared. That was the definition of Y, right? But now I, this is the same as if I take the square root. That's the proof of Chebyshev's inequality. So it just follows from Markov applied to the squared random variable. So the only sort of trick here is here you take the square root. And you know, if you have positive numbers and A squared is bigger than B squared, if and only if A is bigger than B. or non-negative, it's not true otherwise, but yeah. So that's the proof of Chebyshev, it's not complicated. It's a very powerful inequality. So any questions about the proof before I go back to the coin bias example and show you how to apply this? Well, let's go back to what we were doing here, right? We were, we were interested in what's the probability that Q hat, which is X over N, is close to Q. 
And Q, but by the way, Q is the mean of Q hat. Well, this is perfect for Chebyshev's inequality, right? We had a bound on the variance. And so we just apply Chebyshev. So in the bias coin example, you have that the probability that Q hat minus Q is bigger than T is at most the variance of Q hat over T squared. This is by Chebyshev. But now we calculated the variance of Q hat. We did that in the last lecture, right? It's at most one over four N. So one thing that may be new for many of you here is that we're using a lot of inequalities. Right, where we don't actually know what the variance is, but we don't care. We just we just want an upper bound. So it's at most one over four n. So this is at most one over four n t squared. And so now we had set t to be 0.1. And it turns out if you set n to be 500, so you have 500 coin flips, then you get that the probability that this observed you know fraction of heads is it more than 0 0.1 away from the true bias is bounded by one over four times 500 times t squared which is one over 100 in this case so this is one tenth which is one over 20. And I chose this because in statistics, this is the standard confidence interval. So this means the probability that you're off by more than 0.1 is at most 5%. So this means with 95% uh, probability, uh, the estimate Q hat is within 0.1 of Q. I think this is called like a p-value or something in statistics. But this is, this is the basis of almost all statistical experiments, something like Chebyshev's inequality, that you, you, you do something, you observe something, but you could have gotten lucky. So you need, to, you need to prove that it's highly unlikely that you got unlucky. And this is the main tool that allows you to do this. So this number is, you know, sometimes in statistics, this is called confidence. In statistics, confidence that the experiment outcome is close to the true thing you're trying to measure. So any comments on this calculation or questions? Yeah, so somebody said this is like a p-test. So I actually never studied statistics, so I still don't know what that is, but I'm guessing it's something like this. So, okay. So now I wanna say, why is this relevant? This seemed like a silly problem, right? Who, when is it that somebody gives you a bias coin and doesn't tell you the bias? And it sounds kind of like a made up problem, but actually this is how election polling works. So, you know, on election night, there are, I don't know, 70 million people who vote in this country and they don't count all of them on election night. It's impossible, right? So what do you actually do? Well, you do the following. So you have an assumption. Or not an assumption. This is, this is a, a fact, right? On election night, some Q fraction of voters vote for Trump. And the rest of the people, one minus Q fraction, vote for Biden or voted for Biden. This actually happened, I guess, right? And the thing is, we don't know what this Q is. That's what we want to find out. So we don't know this. But it's, it's there, right? It's a real thing. We want to figure out what this Q is without counting everybody. So what do we do? Well, we do this experiment. The experiment is choose n random voters with replacement. 
So that means you, you're allowed to choose the same one twice. And let xi be the b1 if uh, the ith is uh, Trump and zero if uh, Biden. And you do the same thing, right? Now I could go through the same thing again. Or we could just observe that this is exactly the same problem. I'm flipping a coin n times. I want to find this bias Q. So I look at the fraction of people in my random sample who were one. It's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. So here, you know, there's an independence assumption, right? Independently. This is important. The voters shouldn't depend on each other. Each time I draw a fully random person from the whole voter pool. But this is exactly the same as the coin problem. And so the, what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is that if you do this with 500 people, the probability that this number that you calculated is far from the true bias by more than 10% is bounded by one over 20. And that's how election polling works. So the amazing thing about this is that this number is still 500. This does not depend on the total number of people. It doesn't depend on the 70 million people. So while 500 may have seemed like a high number for figuring out the bias of a coin, it's a pretty low number for figuring out how people voted in an election with tens of millions of people. And if you do 2000, then you can get like super duper high accuracy with very high probability. So, and that's, you know, that's doable. So championship inequality is something that's used. I mean, it's used a lot, but it's really used in a, um, uh, in a very visceral kind of a way. So any comments or questions about this? This key observation is the same as the coin problem. And yeah, somebody mentioned in the chat, indeed, if you have, if you're trying to measure the fraction of some population that has some property, then it's always just a coin problem. I mean, it has to be a binary property, yes or no. There are versions of this for, well, actually, you can do this for things that are not zero or one, but it's simpler when it's zero or one. So it's called sampling. In general, if you want to estimate a random variable, if you know it has low variance, then you can estimate it by taking a few random samples. Makes sense. Okay, so that's the end of the section on probability. So any comments before we move on and start the next the next unit. So that's the end of probability. We may use some probability in the graph theory part if we have time later, but we'll see. So now we move on to graph theory, which is actually like one of my main areas of research and I really like it. And um, there's gonna be, it's really a bit of a switch because there's a lot of emphasis on writing again, writing proofs. So,
Looks like my notes are in the wrong order, sorry. Okay, so what is a graph? So it's not, you've used the word graph before in calculus, but it actually has a completely other meaning as well, which is what this is about. So what's a graph? So graph is a mathematical object uh, that models pairwise relationships. So let me give you the formal definition. So a graph G is a pair of sets V comma E Now the set the set V is called the set of vertices. And the set E is called the set of edges. And what's the key relation between these sets? So such that uh, E is a set of unordered pairs of elements of V. So in, in set theoretic notation, E is a subset of the set, which consists of two element subsets of V. Now, so to define the graph, you need two things. You need a set of vertices and a set of edges. Now, this unordered is important. So let me show you an example of a graph. Here's a set, one, two, three, four. And here, the graph, there are many possible subsets of pairs of those elements, right? But here's one particular one. So I have one, two, two, three, three, four. That's a valid graph. Now let's draw a picture of this. So the formal definition of graph is it's a pair of sets. That's all there is to it. But when we think about these intuitively, we often draw pictures. So in the picture, what do we normally do? Well, we draw points for the vertices, labeled points. So labeled points for the vertices. And then we draw lines or they don't have to be lines. We just connect two of the points if there's an edge. The lines could be curved. So one, two is an edge. I'm going to put a line here. Two, three is an edge. I'm going to put a line here. Three, four is an edge. I'm going to put a line here. So that's a picture of that graph. Now, a graph in English is often called a network. It's the same thing. Now, one distinction I want to make is that the thing on the left is a graph. The thing on the right is a picture of a graph. 
The thing on the right is not a is not a pair of sets. It's a geometric thing, right? It's a it's a drawing in the plane. And this is not there's not a one to one correspondence between these things. Here's another picture of the same graph. Same graph. Okay, so picture of a graph. So the same graph can have many different drawings. In fact, always does have infinitely many different drawings. Uh, professor, is there a reason that for the second graph, the lines are curved in comparison to straight? No. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I could make them straight. Um, I mean, sometimes it's more convenient to use curved lines when there are a lot of different points. So you know, let's just say curved lines or edges. So that's an example of a graph. Now let's look at another example. Another example you have the set of vertices, which is a set of students in this class. And then you can define a set of edges to be that two students, P and Q, are, are considered an edge if they have talked to each other or P and Q have met. That's a graph. It's kind of hard to draw because how many vertices are there? Well, I don't know, 240 or something. How many edges are there? I actually don't know. It's a great question. How many edges do you think there are? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really know. This is an example of what's called a social network graph, which of which social networks are an example. but it's a pair of sets. There are many different ways of drawing it, but the inherent structure is the structure of pairwise relationships. And that is encoded in the set of edges, which is just a set of unordered pairs. Any comments or questions on this? So it's an important subject because graphs come up in like in every area of math and applied math and science. So you can see the book for more examples. But, you know, for example, they come up in biology. You can model the brain as a graph. Uh, Google Maps can be viewed as a graph, although it has a lot more information than a graph. So namely, you can look at the street corners as vertices and two vertices are connected by an edge if there's a road between them. Let's just say a two-way road, because I want it to be unordered. Um, here, let me just show you some more pictures of graphs. Here, if you Google, here are a bunch of social network graphs that actually come from online social networks. So this is what, you know, these are, there's a whole area where people study these graphs to try to understand what's going on, usually to sell ads to the, the vertices. Um, anyway, there are a lot of different graphs. Um, and here's another graph that's very cool and very important in math. It's called the Peterson graph. This is a graph that has, I think, 10 vertices, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, 10 vertices. And again, there are many different drawings of the same graph. So this website lists, these are all pictures of the same graph. The set of pairs is the same in all of these pictures. If you, well, you have to label the vertices in an appropriate way, but these are all actually pictures of the same graph. And this is kind of shown in this, there's a cool video here. Okay, so, so, Pictures are very useful, but it's important to have the distinction between the picture and the graph itself, 
which is just a pair of sets. Okay. Yes. We said that um, one graph can have multiple pictures, but one picture can only have one graph. Correct. Yeah, that's a very good point. The picture uniquely specifies the graph because, um, yeah, because of you know because of this association. If I have a picture, I know what the edges are and I know what the vertices are, and that's all I need to know. The picture has more information than the graph. Yes, another question? Not to label like right, because we could sort of call the vertices different things. Yeah, yeah, so I'm only looking at labeled pictures. Cool. Yeah, so unlabeled picture, yeah, that's a whole different, that's a very deep subject actually. If you don't know the labels, then, then yeah, it's hard to find out. If two pictures are the same, but but if you let's we always have the labels. Okay, so now let me show you the historically first graph theory problem that was ever studied in the 1700s in Germany. Oh no, sorry, not this. I don't know what happened there. Um, let me just. Uh... Okay. Well, okay, I didn't want you to look at the right-hand side. Ignore the right-hand side for now. <laughs> okay, so, so, so this is something which uh, I think came out in 1743. This is called the Seven Bridges of Königsberg. So there's a city called Königsberg in Germany where it has a cool, you know, kind of setup like this where it has, so this is a river, which goes, which has an island in it. And it has seven bridges like this as shown. And there is a famous, there's a sort of a, just puzzle in this city which was if you start at point A, so there are four distinguished locations, A, B, C, and D. A is the island, D is another island, and B and C are the shores. And the puzzle that people, I think, just has an, had it as, as an excuse for walking around was, is there a way to walk from A back to A, crossing each bridge exactly once? So this is something you can do. If you go to the city, you can try to do this. You can try to walk around, you know, maybe first you go here and then maybe you go here. Okay, good, looking pretty good so far. And then maybe you go here. But then if you come here, you get kind of stuck, right? So I don't know, you know, you can you can play around with this and, and try various, ooh, not good. Uh, you can play around with this. Okay, I, I guess I can't erase that anymore. Okay, fine. Uh, ah, I can just undo it instead. Okay, so so this is a well-defined puzzle, which people did. And I guess they had fun. And then Euler, the famous mathematician Euler, showed that this is impossible. There's no way to walk from A to A visiting, crossing each bridge exactly once. It's kind of amazing, right? How do you prove something like that? It seems like there are a ton of different possibilities. And so the beauty of graph theory is it gives you the right concepts to prove things like this. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to prove this. The first step is I'm going to abstract this problem into a graph. 
This is really a drawing of a graph. Now, what's the correspondence? Well, there are four distinguished places, A, B, C, and D. So the distinguished places are our vertices. And then the bridges, I'm gonna connect two vertices by an edge if there's a bridge. Okay, so this, this actually brings me to a slightly annoying pedagogical point, which I should have taken care of before coming here, which is, well, there are two different edges between C and A, right? This and this, these are not the same. But in the current definition of graph, there can only be one you know, subset, A C A or AC, right? So actually, I'm going to amend my definition a little bit. I'm going to allow a multi-set. E is a multi-set. So multi-set means it's a set with repetitions. So multi-set means repetitions allowed. Sometimes it's useful to have graphs in which you have some edge appearing twice. So now this is a legit, uh, so, so so yeah, I should say connect two vertices, maybe connect is not a good word. I should say connect two vertices by an edge, right? So, um, so this gives you the edges. So now if I were to write down what the graph is, the set of vertices is A, B, C, and D. The set of edges, well, so there's two AC edges. Then there's a CD edge. Then there's an AD edge. And then there's two AB edges. Oh, sorry, there's also a BD edge. And then there's two AB edges. This is why I needed to allow multi-set, so repetitions are allowed. So, okay, so so then, um, okay, so then this subset doesn't actually make sense either <laughs> because I don't allow, so let's just say repetitions allowed for now. I don't wanna belabor this, it's not a complicated concept. So that's the graph. Now, what, what did I achieve by doing that? Well, what I achieved is I, I, I looked, I've, tur I've now turned it into an abstraction where I'm focusing on only the essential information, which is which pairs of locations are connected to each other by a bridge and not some irrelevant information like how deep is the water or you know which direction is the bridge bound to pointing or something like that. So graphs are good for problems where the essence of the problem lies in the pairwise relationships. So any questions about, I haven't solved the problem yet, but any questions about this formalization of this, of this problem? So we have the, uh, the E um, and for graph B, is that only one possibility of like one, like possible outcome of the graph, can we like do it in a different way? No, so here what I've done is I've modeled my problem with a graph. And my modeling, you know, is based on these rules over here, right? So the places are vertices and the bridges correspond to edges, right? So there's only one way to do that for this particular map. Uh, but why can't we just, draw A, B, C, D on, on a line and just connect. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. You could draw it in a different way, that's fine. But but this is unique. The, the line that connect is unique. No, 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 no. The, the graph is unique. The drawing is not unique, but the graph is unique. Remember, a graph is a pair of sets, V yeah. and oh. Yeah. 
Kind Does that of. make sense? Yeah. The pairwise relationships are uniquely defined. The drawing, you know, maybe a few different ways to draw it, but. So, so this graph, by the way, has four vertices and seven edges. So let's now prove Euler's theorem, which is there is no way to walk from A to A crossing each bridge exactly once. And let's look at the right-hand drawing because that somehow contains the essential features. Let me actually copy this to the next page since I'm going to have a proof of Euler's theorem. Well, some creativity is required here. This is not something I would be able to come up with on the spot if somebody uh, Ask me, although it looks like somebody has answered this in the chat. So somebody says no, because D has three vertices. Okay, so that's not, I think you have the right idea. Do you want to try to rephrase that? Three edges include D. Okay, good. So yeah, so you're saying look at this particular vertex D. There are three edges coming out of this, right? Okay, now why does that say this is impossible? What's wrong with having three edges? So if you wanna come back to A, wouldn't you need like, uh, an even number of bridges, like two. An even number of bridges coming out of where? Of A. Uh, that's a great point, yeah. So you're saying A has one, two, three, four, five edges. So yeah, you know, you, we could do with A as well. You're saying, so you're pointing out that A has five edges, D has three edges. Uh, okay, since A was distinguished, let's just do the proof using A, right? So let, let, let's so so assume for contradiction uh, that a walk using exactly using each edge exactly once exists. Okay, so it's actually gonna be a little easier to write using D since A is kind of special and I may, I don't wanna worry about the beginning and the end. So I'll do it using D. So I'm gonna consider vertex D. And now assume D is visited some number of times, right? So assume by what does visit mean? Assume I enter and exit D exactly k times. Assume the walker enters and exits D exactly k times with some integer bigger than one. That's without loss of generality, right? If you're gonna do this walk, so first of all, you have to enter and exit D, otherwise you wouldn't use any of the bridges touching D, right? If you use a bridge, you have to end up using both of it, uh, entering and exiting both of its endpoints. So now the key observation is that every time you enter and exit D, you use exactly two edges. exactly two edges are used. This is the key observation. So observe, 
right? So every, every time, it doesn't matter. The beauty of this is it doesn't matter what the walk is. Regardless of the walk, if you're walking, if you enter D, then you've entered D. Now you have to leave by a different edge, right? Because you're not allowed to use the same edge twice. So every time you enter and exit D, you use exactly two edges. Let's be more precise, exactly two edges incident to D are used. This is a terminology which is used, which I'll specify more in a moment. So what's the new terminology being used here? Well, incident to D. That means an edge has D as one of its endpoints. But now this doesn't make sense, right? Because the total number of edges incident to D is three. So, well, all of them have to be used. So if all edges are used in the walk, then three has to be two times K, which is impossible. So there's no such walk. Any comments or questions on this proof? So the point of this is you want to start at some location and end at that location from where you started? Right. So you want to start at A and end at A? So yeah, OK. I guess I could have added more detail. So the only thing I used here is you entered and exited at least one time. Because uh, if k was equal to 0, you wouldn't use all the edges, right? The edges incident to D are unused. So I guess I should have written that in the argument. So that was an important point because the problem asks you need to cross every bridge exactly once. A to A, that's a good question. So where did we use that it was A to A? Well, we didn't specifically use that. What we, what we, what we used more was the structure of the walk. So we're going to define all this rigorously in a moment. This is kind of there to show you that there's some interesting math going on here, but we need a very precise language to, you know, to make sure we're not making a mistake. So what facts did we use here? We use that if you enter a vertex, you have to exit it. And that's where we use the A to A. Because if it was A to D, then you could enter D without exiting, exiting it, right? So yeah, maybe a more, so maybe I should add, have added more detail. Assume that every vertex other than A is entered and exited the same number of times. Right, so let's, let's add another. So every vertex other than A must be exited every time it's entered. Great question. That's where we used that it's from A to A. Does that answer the question? What would be um, like the minimum amount of bridges that would have to be crossed twice in order to make the walk from A to A and cross each bridge at least once? That's a great question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but it's exactly the kind of question you ask in graph theory. What is the minimum 
number of edges that must be crossed twice uh, to walk from A to A using every edge at least once? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe nice question to formulate and prove a conjecture about this. We can revisit it next time. Um, but what I want to do since time is short is I want to just specify some vocabulary to try to make this proof a little more rigorous in the language of graph theory. So the reason graph theory is a real challenge with writing is you're really just talking about something precisely, right? There are no equations anymore. There's not even that much set theoretic notation. So let me just introduce some basic graph theory concepts that are useful. So terminology is, um, if uh, u, v is an edge, or let's say x, y, because my u's and v's look kind of similar. Or let's say if a comma b is an edge, then a is adjacent to b. This is just terminology, but this is just so we can all agree on how to talk about these things. Uh, if a, b is an edge, then, so let's call this edge E. Then E is incident with A and also incident with B. So it's incident with the two vertices that are contained in it. So here E is an edge, right? I've used a letter to denote an edge. Okay. Similarly, if E is an edge, I mean, I guess I didn't have to write this so many times. It, it's all the same. Um, it's really just one thing. So if e, if e is an edge with vertices A and B, then A is adjacent to B, E is incident with A and incident with B, and A and B are the endpoints. of E. So in this case, for example, you know, if I have this edge E, then E is incident with C and D. C and D are the endpoints of E, and C and D are adjacent. Okay. Uh, the number of edges incident with a vertex is called the degree. So, the, so it's denoted dag of V or dag of A is the cardinality of the set of all edges in the graph such that E is incident with A. So for example, in this in this example here, the degree of the vertex C is how many edges are incident with it? One, two, three is three. So I used incident to D already in the proof. And here really the fact that's coming into play is that the degree of D is three. I could have done it with C or B as well, but I did it with D. Okay, so I won't have time to talk about the walk since I've run out of time. So I'll just do one more quick sort of general jargon that's used. So if a graph has no repeated edges, it's called a simple graph.
So this graph is not a simple graph because it has repeated edges. So this is not simple. And these graphs have a name, they're called multigraphs. So this graph up here is a multigraph. So okay, this so far we didn't we we did prove this Königsberg thing, and I introduced you to some truly graph theoretic reasoning, right? That we talked about in, in this walk. We we zoomed in on what was happening at this one vertex, and we said, well, because you have to come back to A. For every other vertex, every time you enter, you have to exit. And then you can pair up the exits and entries because every bridge is only used once. And then you get this contradiction. So next time we'll prove you know, more interesting things, but that kind of conveys the spirit of, of graph theory. So that's it. Um, are, are you gonna be... Uh joining the strike on Thursday? Uh, I am not going to be joining the strike on Thursday. Okay. Thank so you. yeah, so we'll have a class on Thursday. Thank you. Yep.